So Susie, uh, this is really exciting to have you uh, um, on video to have a discussion with you about your book, Against the Loveless World. Um, we're really excited about this book at our site, and I personally am excited about it. I want to say why a little bit, and then uh, viewers are here to hear you, not me. So I'm going to get out of the way as much as possible in this discussion. But to me, what is just kind of dramatic and sort of majestic and exciting about this book is that it really does relate the life of a Palestinian refugee and her world, this kind of big epic world around her in a way that I've not read before. Dramatic, epic, David Copperfield kind of way. You are getting the story of this woman uh, who has lived so much of the Palestinian experience over the 80s, 90s, into the um, 2000s, sort of. That's the, that's the sort of frame of this book. And I just enjoyed it so much in those terms, just as a just it, it it's not there's no zionist frame to this there's no kind of american frame there's no kind of western approved frame to this uh story it's it's told really from the throbbing life of of, of a palestinian refugee and that includes things i mean just wonderful moments like uh, i guess my favorite line in the book being um uh, Sidi Wasfia. I don't know if I'm saying her name right. Sidi Wasfia, she's, yeah. Yeah, the grandmother character. I mean, the, the, the minor characters in this book are to die for. Um, but the grandmother says, you know, I have underwear older than the Zionist entity. Yeah. <laughs> so, and um, so that, that uh, I, I, I'm interrupting myself, but the book moves from uh, Kuwait and the Palestinian life of Kuwait in the uh, late 80s and 90s. Um, uh, and then it shifts to Amman, and then it shifts to Palestine during the Second Intifada. And we are just getting this kind of vital understanding of the um, of Palestinian consciousness, again, without any framework or uh, you know, reservation or effort to check it against American sensibility. So I, 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 I enjoyed the fact that the book, the, the characters, when they refer to the Zionists, come, they say the Jews are coming, you know, which is what people would say, you know, and I've heard people say the Jews are coming. Yeah, this, of course you'd say that. Um, and uh, so I'm going to shut up in a second, but I, I also feel like issues like violent resistance, dispossession. I, I don't know. It's just so much. You understand these things in a way that you you have not before. I I'd have not before as an American uh, who is, you know, only made visits to Palestine. And uh, so um, I'm curious, um, you said this book in your afterward, you said this book was 20 years in the making. Can you tell us about the making of this book and what you were trying to do and why it took so long? Um, so I wasn't, um, you know, I, I didn't start writing it 20 years ago. Um, a lot of the, um, what I meant by that is that writing this book drew on um, at least 20 years of um, experience and and wanting certain elements of the story to to come to light in literature. Namely, um, number one was the the um, catastrophic effect uh, and reverberations that were felt throughout the Middle East um, from the uh, U.S. invasion and and destruction of Iraq. Um, so that was one thing, and and you know certainly, and of course, told from a Palestinian point of view, <clears throat> um, particularly those who were who who were part of that mass exodus from Kuwait in the wake of that. Um, and the other thing was the uh, uh, was the sex industry um, in in the Arab world, and uh, um, and how it's you know accentuated in some of the countries that have a lot of oil money, especially or, or just you know wealthier nations in the Arab world. So those are two things that um, you know for, for twenty some odd years that I kind of have had in the back of my 
mind and have been brewing in, in a story. Um, my family lives in Kuwait. I was born in Kuwait. Um, and you know they all lived through the um, the occupation of Kuwait by Iraq, and and so I had a lot of um, you know um, trusted sort of accounts of a lot of the you know the, the daily the daily things that were happening. And I was I was in college at the time. I was in the United States, and so I had um, I mean communication phone lines were mostly shut off, but um, at you know various points there were communications, and I you know had, was getting reports from my family there. Um, regarding the, uh, um, I really appreciate hearing from you that you didn't feel like there was any kind of Western frame. Um, uh, that really means a lot to me to hear because, um, you know, with all of my other books, I, I, I always intentionally kind of ignore, um, ignore any kind of re potential reader perceptions or what my publisher might think and, and whatnot. And I really try and keep a one track mind um which is complete loyalty to the characters and telling their story truthfully um and you mentioned specifically the idea you know um the some of in some of the dialogue where palestinians say the jews are coming the jews are coming um that's actually in in my second novel as well and interestingly one of my foreign publishers in um in a in a european country i'm, I'm not going to say which one but um uh, actually more than one had asked me to change that and say, you know, well, the Zionists are coming or something like <laughs> that. And, um, and, you know, I said, look, I understand, you know, uh, I understand that your readers have a certain kind of sensitivity, but um, I, I can't be, I can't be concerned with that. This is what we say. This is what mm -hmm. we can say. Beautiful. And Beautiful. those are the, you know, um, mm. and we understand, you know, the context of what that means. Palestinian, but we understand what we're talking about. We know that we're not saying, you know, you know, Jews in general coming. But of course, when we say the Jews. We know who we're talking about. We know it's Israel, and that's how kid. That's what kids say. You know, I, the, Yahoo, the, the Yahoo picked them up, and and um, uh, and you know, I kind of I reject this idea of anti-Semitism among Palestinians because, you know, I think I think there has to be, you know just like racism, anti-Semitism operates on a power gradient. Um, you know, when Palestinians feel, um, you know, mistrust, uh, especially, you know, Palestinians in, in Palestine, who whose really only exposure to Jews has been soldiers and, and brutality, when they have a mistrust or even antipathy toward um, Israelis or even Jews in general, it is not the same as Europeans or Americans or somebody like me in the United States having those feelings about Jews in general because because it's general because it's different. We live in a privileged place. Europeans um, have power and have a history of of oppressing Jews and 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 committing unspeakable crimes against them. So the, the application of that label cannot be, you can't, you can't use the same label that you uh -huh. use with Europeans to Palestinians because we are in fact victimized by Israelis. Um, we, are, we are victimized by the Jewish state and uh -huh. Palestinian reaction to that is not the same as European reactions to, uh -huh. uh, it, does that make sense? I mean- Yeah, no, I feel power uh, right it makes sense, but it's also something that comes through from the book itself. I mean, uh, the life of the book, these aren't people who are sitting around reading the Protocols of the Elders of Zion or a Mein Kampf. These are people who are having these rich, vital, but also really screwed up lives because of, you know, Zionism. That You can see their context. I mean, it's just very clear to me that this is not about the Jews, you know, or yeah. it's about who, the Jewish state, you know, and right. it's very, it's very Even clear. With that, you know, we also understand that, you know, we have a rich and ancient history that includes Christians, Muslims, and Jews. We understand that, you know, those original Jews, the Hebrew tribes are, are, you know, our ancestors, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the people who, who remained, who converted between religions, who never left. I mean, those, you know, that heritage, I believe, is more Palestinian than it is European Jewry. Uh -huh. 
-huh. if that makes sense. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So let's um, let's talk about a couple of the characters in the book. Um, I've also already and and I should emphasize the center of this book is this uh, uh, is a young woman. Not her, I'm not I'm sure the pronunciation. I already mispronounced yeah. Yahoot. Uh, she has three names. She's our our main character. All the focus is through her. She's a turbulent, fascinating, feisty, ungovernable. Uh, refugee and also a sex worker at some point and ultimately uh, a character in Palestinian resistance inside mm -hmm. the West Bank. And the, that book is actually told, I should just inform readers, uh, listeners, from uh, you're getting her story from a prison cell in Israel. Um, and uh, so mm -hmm. um, she's obviously, you know, the life of the book, but there are these characters who are just so, I mean, uh, the character of Uma Burak. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that Burak. wrong. Yeah, that's good. All right. I mean, she's just, uh, tell us about her. This woman is just, she is the kind of the live wire uh, uh, in terms of a narrative. You just know she's coming back. She's coming back. She's coming back. And she's yeah. both bad, evil, and good. It's just kind of a wonderful character. Tell us about her. Um, I loved writing Um Burak, actually. And um, you know, in the original, in the early iterations, she um, she doesn't come back. But she, you know, this has happened in nearly every one of my books where, you know, there's a character that's intended to be a relatively minor character, ends up having this really big personality that, that sort of just takes up so much space, so much sort of emotional space in the narrative. And, um, and they, they suffuse the story. And that, that, and, and in this novel, it was on Burak. And um, so she, it just, it, it, in those iterations where, you know, her role kind of ended relatively early, um, it never felt right. It was like haunting me, like, where's on Burak? I need her back. Yeah, definitely. And so very late in the development of the story, um, the ending was a little bit different. Um, so as you said, Nahar tells her story in retrospect from an Israeli pr isolation prison cell called the Cube. And so she's speaking in past tense about, you know, her life and, and she's telling her story of how she, you know, where she started and how she ended up in that cell. Um, but it's at one point in, in the story, uh, towards the end, like, you know, there's like maybe 5% of the book left the story catches up to her present and she begins speaking in present tense that this part was added at a relatively late stage in the story development. And I did it because I needed Umburak to come back. <laughs> it's a good reason. It's and a good it reason. Felt, it felt really like sometimes things click, you know, um, and you just, you know, when something doesn't feel right about the story and I don't really know what it is. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm still fiddling and, with with different things and then um but when i added that those last chapters really just kind of came out pretty mm -hmm. much as they as they appear in the final version they were barely edited because but, that's how right it felt to to bring her uh, susie i'm uh, sorry to interrupt i just want you i want you to tell reader uh, listeners who is um barack yeah I, I, they don't uh, many of them don't know who we're talking about and we're both we both love her as character but tell us about who this person is and what her her role is in the book yeah, so Umburak um, begins as um, a, a an awful character. Um, at least that's you know I think readers will despise her initially. She be, she is um, she becomes Nahar's procurus. I mean she she pimps her out basically, and she's the she kind of blackmails Nahar into getting into the sex trade in a way. Um, but as the story develops, and this was the part that. Um, I mean, as a writer, I, I, I love this relationship so much between the two of, two of them. It's very, it's a very complex relationship. On the one hand, Nahar initially, you know, she hates Zomborak and she wants to get away from her. Um, but as the story develops, you know, the two of them um, have a lot of experiences together and Umburak has her back. Um, Umburak herself, as her story, uh, you know, unfolds, you know, you, you come to learn that she she is a victim of her circumstances as well. She's trying to survive in this patriarchal, shitty world. Um, and, and, and there's a genuine love between them. 
uh, that develops. Um, Umburak, you know, does something extraordinary for, for Nahar at one point. Um, and they they survive the Iraq's occupation together. Um, and they share the secret um, that only, you know, that like for Nahar, Umburak is the only one who can understand her in some ways. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh -huh. um, I, I, somebody, a reviewer one time wrote that, you know, I understand female kinship. And I think, you know, as a, as a writer, I think that's where I feel sometimes um, my greatest or my best writing occurs is when it's the relationships between women that are, uh -huh. you know, that are replete with um, love and friendship and jealousy and, and sabotage, uh -huh. and all the, uh -huh. all the wonderful things that women experience yeah. together. Yeah, it's fa I agree with that statement. And um, again, I don't want to delve too deep in the weeds here for people who haven't read the book, but just the the extended family in Amman. I mean, that's just really exciting on those grounds. I mean, there's nothing mm -hmm. held back and you just see all the rivalries and this is great. It's fun. It's it's very, it's a family drama, you know, that's that's very intense and satisfying. But I want to move to something that Umbarak says that is actually a theme of this book, a larger literary theme that I think uh, our viewers would want to hear about. And that is, um, she says, you know, you have to make your own, she, she tells um, Nahar uh, early on, you got to make your own normal in life. And that touches on the fact that the book itself is titled um, by, is written by a prisoner. Um, it's, it bears the title of, uh, from a line from James Baldwin, Against the Loveless World is, uh, is from his writings, as you quote them, I didn't know this before. And um, similarly, there's a sense in the book, I think it's actually stated, I'm looking at my notes, it's been a couple of weeks, but in, in, I think you say that the prisoner and the prostitute are the most reliable custodians of truth and values at some point. You make that kind of statement, or maybe Um Barak makes that statement. I'm not sure. I think that Nacher makes the statement, or you, the narrator, whatever. It's a truth of this book, and part of the consciousness of this book, which transcends Palestine and the politics of Palestine, great as they are in the life of the book, but it, it's to general issues of con our human consciousness and the degree to which the most alienated uh, from society are actually the greatest witnesses of what society is is doing. Do you, can you take it away from that, that yeah. my uh, comments? So, yeah, so that, that is a line um, uh, from Nahar in the book where she says, um, she says whores are the most um, reliable custodians um, of truth because they have no voice in the world and, 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 you know, what they get to witness. I mean, people, um, people are more, uh, expose themselves, expose their, their true nature to, uh -huh. to people who have no power because they are no threat and they, and nobody will listen to them. They have no voice. They're muted in the world. Um, and so she makes that remark that, you know, of, of how much people who are pushed to the margins of society, can see about the nature of that society that most members of that society cannot see, cannot, cannot, cannot acknowledge themselves. Um, and it is precisely because they, they are not listened to, they are not valued and they are not, and they don't have a voice um, that they are able to see that. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so moving on to another element of the book that I think uh, people would be very interested in, and I'm cu curious to learn how much of this comes from research, how much of this comes from your own life. Uh, there is a very rich awareness in this book of uh, the flora of Palestine and the food of the Middle East. And that's something that you are delighting in as a storyteller and the reader then gets to kind of revel in it because it's got this very sensual and also taxonomical element too. I mean, you sort of are getting to see how body butters are made or you're getting to see, you know, the naming of uh, all these different flowers and herbs and stuff and 
it's very rich and sensual in that sense, the book. Yeah. And I'm curious, again, is this something, it doesn't matter whether, you know, you research the entire thing or you live the entire thing. I don't really care. I mean, but yeah. I, I'm curious, you know, well, how much of this is, uh, how you how you develop that understanding and yeah so i mean so for one thing as a writer you know you kind of want to um you, you want the reader to see what the characters are seeing and what the characters feel and observe um palestinians have a very rich um botanical heritage um that you know unfortunately is uh is is slowly being lost because um because we don't have access to to the land anymore we you know i think israel outlawed i mean picking wild zatar in the hills was just you know something all palestinian families did you know because we made our own zatar we cooked with it and stuff and israel made it illegal so you know just things like that um and there you know there have been movements within palestine to try and resurrect our you know botanical heritage in this book um, the land itself is kind of a character um, because it's it's an important part of the story. It's a very it's a silent sort of undergirding um, thread that runs through the, the novel in the same way that it runs through our lives as Palestinians, as exiles and occupied um, indigenous people. Um, and the. Um, the 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 some some of the herbs um are things that you know i kind of uh i'm just fortunate enough to inherit from my grandmother um a lot of the flora are things that i researched and i actually do that for all of my books because i i i always make a, a point to know um what what will be in bloom what will the landscape look like at a particular time of year in this particular region of Palestine or whatever setting the characters are in because I think that's important um, in in a story at least you know as a reader I like to know that I like to see and feel what the characters are experiencing um, you see that also in Kuwait I mean Nahir you know when she growing up in Kuwait she talks a lot about the desert she talks about the the, the ocean um, the Arabian Gulf um, uh, you know sort of being there being in that salty air and and what that feels like what it smells like and of course the same thing um in palestine in particular and as a matter of fact so it's not just the 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 landscape that she's describing but what that landscape evokes and there's a one there's a point in the novel where she's coming from jordan and then going into palestine and she makes she she remarks that you know the landscape is similar, right? It's it's hilly and rocky, and 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 in places verdant, and um, uh, and in some places, uh, um, you know, more brown. And, and but she says, despite the the similarity in the in the way the terrain looks, it's just it feels different here. When you cross the Jordan River, there's something else. And then she goes on to describe what that difference is, and so it's not just what one sees in the landscape, but what that evokes in the character emotionally and, and psychologically. You're muted. I, I muted myself because I was about to sneeze. Thank you. Um, and um, so Susie, let's, I want to um, sort of segue a little from, uh, bring up another aspect of the book that touches on the discourse of Palestine in the West. And you have already brought this up in this, when you said that certain editors or translators uh, or publishers objected to certain language, uh, you know, years ago in with Mornings in Janine or some other book, okay. But one of the great things about the book, again, referring to this, you know, Palestinian frame, this is a Palestinian story. You know, Leon Uris did not think about Palestinians for a second when he was writing his book. And no one in America who's setting out to write about Israel, uh, the birth of Israel and the destruction of Palestine, you know, no one has to think about Palestinians to get published in this country. I mean, it helps not to think about Palestinians yeah. in order to get published. 
So that again is a beautiful thing about this book is that it's not you're not rejecting that fr you're just taking the frame that uh, of a certain of 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 the people from whom you come the world you know you are taking that and and delivering it to a reader and one of the great things is that we really see the second intifada from inside uh or elements of the second intifada from inside and that includes the um i think well i mean uh, i don't want to get too much into giving away parts of the story, but as I, I mean, there, it's not a question of civilian targets, but there are military targets that are very clearly identified in this book, and and uh, colonial outpost uh, targets, and um, I wonder whether that's the kind of I, I want to. I mean, first of all, it's it's a great tale of the Second Intifada for me, and and how um, these just the perceptions of it inside Palestine. Um, uh, I, again, it's been a couple of weeks, but I feel, I, I know that um, there's some, the, the case of, I'm forgetting his name, the guy who set up uh, um, above the, uh, in the hills above that checkpoint and shot at the- uh, Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, that story is so well told. Yeah, this is yeah. one of the iconic stories of Palestine. Uh, yeah. Susie, you should tell us, but it, it involves this, uh, sh please. But that's in the book. And you just get to hear this story, which is a thrilling story or or dramatic story from, from a Palestinian voices passing it on to each other as the legend spreads. Um. Yeah, so there was um uh there was there was a there was a, a, a sniper by the name of um Thaer, Thaer Hamad who um who stood in a, at this checkpoint Wadi Dinar, it kind of became legendary in the second intifada and he just kept picking off soldiers. He fired 22 bullets and he killed 22 soldiers. And um, and he uh, he left he left because you know it was an old it was like an old um, um, like World War II kind of rifle and it jammed and he left it um, and at one point uh, an Israeli a settler woman is coming through with her kids and he and he you know he wasn't gonna about he wasn't gonna kill civilians and so he let her go um, and he only he picked off soldiers and. It in, you know, Israel kind of, uh, they lost their mind over that. And they actually didn't believe that Palestinian, it was a Palestinian. They thought maybe it was someone from the IRA or something because, because it was, it was executed so skillfully and they, they couldn't imagine that, you know, where, how a Palestinian sniper would have been able to train. Um, they couldn't even find his hiding place. Like they looked everywhere. They couldn't even hide. But in the end, you know, he was given away by, uh, um, he made the mistake of confiding in someone and, um, and you know, it, it was uh, mm -hmm. kind of got around and, and he was captured. But so this, the story became legendary and yes, it was told, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it was a triumph for Palestinians who are accustomed to, to being the ones who were sniped at and take, you know, picked off like that by soldiers. Um, yeah. And, yeah, <laughs> I as part of my own uh, personal journey here is that I did a hike in Palestine. I you go hiking when I'm in Palestine with this group, mm -hmm. and we were at some on some hillside at a height, and it, it, this our guide, you know, was saying, "Well, this is where it happened," and I, I never heard oh, about it before. Heard about it. <laughs> so it was. Um, so uh, uh, in that connection, you know, there's also in the book there is uh, some. Uh, uh, some actions involving water in a settlement. And I'm wondering, is that drawn from real life? Is that something you experienced? Or uh, I don't want to get into it in too much detail. I don't want to give away the story, but it's pretty exciting. So, um, no, this is all imagined, um, but it's not too far from the imagination. As you know, settlers are constantly trying to poison Palestinian um, water springs and things like that. Um, this was sort of this is kind of uh, this has it, it arose from my own um, frustration with the ways that you know armed resistance are sometimes conducted. I think we we have a right to armed resistance, and 
we, and there's this sort of, sometimes I feel like a lack of imagination on how that can be done, you know? There's a lot of ways, there's a lot of sabotage, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, there's no way we can, we can, and not in the current context, could ever beat, you know, Israel militarily. I mean, it's a nuclear power and they have, you know, the most modern death machines. But I think people have a right to defend themselves. And they have, you know, when you, I mean, they have no defense. There was, they have nowhere to turn. I mean, when, when settlers, as you know, Phil, descend on them, they, there's no police to call. There's nothing. They they take it. They take the the, the destruction of their property, the death, the murder of their children. They take it, um, and that's it. And um, but there, are, you know, there are way there are other ways to imagine self defense. There's other ways, and and so that's kind of that's where all of that was born from. Uh -huh. um, the characters are are all revolutionaries. There, and it's actually Nahar who sort of introduces, as you know, this sort of um this new way of of imagining a, a revolution and thinking about things and it's actually drawn from her experience as a dancer i mean not that, you know among many things nahad is a dancer and she it's something since she was a child that you know she loved to do and um sort of mesmerized everybody around her with with the way she just kind of you know was transported by music and and dance um and she, you know, first to to the to the amusement and even um, ridicule of of her of her friends um, when she first introduces this idea about revolution based on dance. Um, but it was only you know a little bit later. Actually, one of the characters who's kind of it's kind of sexist and you know, he kind of comes around, he's like, wait a minute, you know, I think what you said makes some sense. And so they devise this whole strategy of armed resistance and, you know. Great, yeah, it works, it works. Um, so I am curious, you brought up ways in which um, some of your uh, ideas have been a little uncomfortable for, or, or th that obviously not just some of your ideas, a lot of ideas that come out of Palestine, a lot of narratives that come out of Palestine are not embraced with open arms in the West. And yet um, you have led a fairly, um, or late, certainly lately, I mean, you're, you're, you're having a stellar literary career. You were, um, your book has been, I haven't, I didn't check into this closely. I, I've gotten the impression that it's been widely lauded, including by the New York Times, and which I think caused you to raise an eyebrow. Um, and uh, so I am, it's a double barreled question. Mm. One part of the question is about how violent resistance and other um, sort of Palestinian tools of resistance are viewed in the West and by publishers, and B, doesn't your success with this book uh, that has very new transgressive ideas uh, for our discourse, isn't that a very hopeful sign about what's happening to the discourse? So um, sorry to give you such a big two-part question, but take it away, please. Yeah, so, um... <clears throat> So, so I, I'm not as widely accepted as you might think I am. Um, uh, and the stellar career has not really translated so much in the United States until recently. Um, and so, so for example, you know, mornings in general, like, as you know, I couldn't, it, it was insanely difficult to get to, to even find a publisher here. And I, and I didn't, it was only, I had to go through Europe and then finally, you know, finding a publisher in the UK that had an, uh, you know, a branch in the U S that published it. Um, Mornings and Janine didn't get a single review in the United States and, and this, and you know, all the, it, I mean, it sold, you know, the sales exceeded my wildest expectations with Mornings and Janine, but that was entirely by word of mouth. It was readers, um, recommending it and um, and to the point that it's kind of become a classic in, in Palestinian Anglophile literature. Um, and yet despite that success of Mornings in Janine, when when The Blue Between Sky and Water what, um, was published, again, I mean, like there were no, nobody was, was interested in reviewing it. 
I, I ended up switching agencies um, in the middle of writing this book. And my, my new agent, um, uh, I feel so lucky to have, um, Anjali Singh from Panday Literary Agency, thought that this was just be really an easy slam dunk sell. And, um, and I, you know, I, I remember telling her, well, you know, don't be so sure. <laughs> um, and she was, you know, she, she, you know, she was surprised how hard it was for her to find, um, to find a publishing house for my new book. Um, in her view, she thought, you know, I was coming to her as somebody who was established with, um, with a good sized platform. And, um, but still it, you know, publishers are still very reluctant to, to touch um, something that is um, unapologetically or resolutely Palestinian. Um, and, and that, you know, criticizes Israel in a way that um, is still not acceptable to criticize Israel. And, um, but of course it took, you know, women, other women of color in the publishing industry to, to purchase this book. And, um, and I, again, I, I, I mean, I feel so fortunate with this book to have landed with um, a team of women of color uh, at Atria and my agent. And, and I think for me, that's what has made the difference with this book. They, you know, um, I mean, the publishing world is largely, um, it's mostly, it's, it's very Anglo, um, just, you know, even though the, the writers that are, that are, there's a lot more writers of color, those who sort of are the gatekeepers of what books get published are largely white American with, you know, with kind of a shared experience that doesn't include people who literally just sort of struggle on the margins. And, um, and so there's a different view, a general view of what's acceptable, acceptable or not acceptable in public discourse and in, in, in publishing. Um, so I, again, so I was lucky I, I landed with Atria Books, um, which is a, a, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. And I just had this remarkable team of publicists, and and I know even 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 they sort of struggled. The um, I couldn't believe the New York Times picked it up, and and it wasn't really a great review. Like it was, they weren't really laud lauding it so much, but it was it was still a good review. Um, I was I mean, I was happy they you know they um, I mean it's a huge platform, so I was happy that they you know they um, took a second look at my book, but. Um, but ultimately it doesn't really, it doesn't matter. Like I, um, my career doesn't hinge on the New York times. It's, it's a big platform and, and certainly I get to, you know, reach a lot more readers, hopefully. Um, but it's fine if they hadn't, you know, I wasn't ever counting on ever being in the New York times. Um, but one, something else that has happened though, is that um, my publisher submitted this book for a few prizes and, um, you know, they're just starting to come in now. And um, the, it was recently long listed for the Aspen Words um, Literary Award Prize, and um, which is, you know, which is a big deal. And it, it kind of signals to me that maybe something is changing, you know, people are, are, are starting to, um, to want to, to read us, you know, to want to, uh, to want, to want a perspective that is native to us rather than having people tell our story who aren't Palestinian, which has been the case, you know, uh, forever until, you know, the last 10 years or so, um, everything in the West that enjoys the sunshine um, has uh, that's written um, on Palestine has not been written by us. Um, it's just a lot of people who presume to speak for us and about us. Um, and they're the ones who get, you know, who get the sunshine and, and the, the, the recognition and the book reviews and the awards and whatnot. Um, so just getting this Aspen awards long list signals to me that um, things are shifting a little bit um, because this book doesn't 
it can't be like your token Palestinian voice, right? It's not a, it's not a, no. it's not uh -huh. a, you know, Palestinian story that, yeah. that doesn't, um, you know, that, that doesn't, you know, put a hammer on Israel's head or something. And that's just not in my nature to do that. You know, I, um, you know, Israel, Israel's, you know, my exile and the destruction of my family and the destruction of everything that, um, of our whole world, you know, has, has defined my life in so many ways and very, um, in very personal ways. So that is so, and you know me well enough that I, um, I don't ever feel like I need to tread softly and I don't feel like I need to account for, um, the sensitivities of the people who did that to me. Um, and, and, and it's really important to me to, for Palestinian characters and literature to speak their truth um, without, without apology, uh -huh. you know, and, and understanding that, yeah, they're going to be judged. I mean, there's a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of readers will, um, and will judge the characters. Some will think them awful. Some, you know, how could you do that with the water? You know, those are people just, uh -huh. like, I mean, and, and, and it's fine. Um, sure. And it's not my job to to judge them to Absolutely. say that they're yeah. right or wrong. It's my job to to tell the story and and just to tell it as honestly as I as I possibly can um, within whatever skill set I have as a writer. Mm -hmm. So, Susie, I want to get on to more discourse questions, but you did use the word personal. You mentioned personal life there, and I just want to ask you one personal life question about this book. Uh, you know, I don't know you that well, but I think of you as uh, an American writer. You live in Philadelphia, and you're telling a very Palestinian story uh, that's set in Asia, chiefly. Um, so, how much of can you give me a little sense of uh, if you to the extent that you want to draw the curtain on this? How much of you is in Nahar, the character who is telling us this wonderful story? Yeah. Um, well, I am Palestinian. I mean, you know, in terms of, uh, I, I mean, I live in the United States. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I consider myself a part of this society as well. Um, uh -huh. I consider myself American. Um, but, you know, um, I, I am Palestinian first and foremost. You know, I didn't, I wasn't born here. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up uh, large, you know, as a, as a child, I was in Kuwait and then I was in Jerusalem. Um, my formidable years were spent in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I never left there. You know, mm -hmm. I came here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, at the age of 13, so I was young enough that, uh, you know, I've integrated into the society. Mm -hmm. But um, there have been a lot of moments in, in my life in the United States where that remind me that I don't belong here. And uh -huh. I, and especially, you know, moments after 9-11, for example, um, you know, when I came here as a child, when I was 13, I, I was complete misfit. You know, I couldn't really read or read or write English. I, I, I didn't make friends easily. Um, so I never really felt a belonging. Um, uh -huh. And, and part of that is my own nature. I'm, I'm pretty introverted. Um, I have a small circle of friends that I let into my life. And, and um, uh, but there, I have always had this longing to, you know, to go back. Uh -huh. um, that, and that's, that's not abstract for me. It's very real and very personal. Uh -huh. And, you know, I feel it when I, uh -huh. when I go overseas. I feel it deeply uh -huh. to be surrounded by Arabic, to hear the Adan five times a day. Um, like, that's that's really meaningful to me. And and when I come back, the absence of that is um, uh -huh. is, is wounding, frankly. Uh -huh. So, um, uh -huh. I yeah, yeah, I've spent uh -huh. more of my life in this country than anywhere else. Uh-huh. But I'm. I've never felt settled here. Huh. I've never. I mean, I'm comfortable. Yes. I have my environment and my friends and my community. Yes. Um. You, you know, there's a part in the book where Nahid says that you know, um, that Siti Wasfiya's heart never left Palestine, and uh -huh. and that's kind of how I feel. Uh -huh. You know, and and since Israel banned me from even going as a visitor, uh -huh. that 
those sentiments and those feelings have been accentuated uh, mm -hmm. in pretty profound ways. Mm -hmm. you know, actually, when you were talking about, you know, going to Palestine, going hiking, like I felt that, you know, I felt mm -hmm. like, um, like I can't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Remind us of this um, that, that you, you you're banning because uh, I'm sorry I you know we we have a wide ranging conversation here and yet this is a true journalistic fact that people watching this are going to say what you know tell us um, well I don't know why they banned me I've never know you know they they I guess they don't have to tell you when they have you know all the guns but I'm not allowed that you know they they turned me back at the border twice. Um, the last time they, you know, they threw me in that little air oh, right. that they have and held me there. And I, and you guys actually, Mondo Weiss was, were, was the first paper to write about it. And I, I have always been grateful for that. Wow. Uh, yeah. Thank you. What, uh, so Susie, wait, I just want to say, I'm interrupting you again, cause I want to, but I, I feel like that love of Palestine and that uprootedness and what you did, that answer you just gave us a minute ago is a beautiful and it's in this book that uh longing and love is in this book so uh, it's something that you've you have poured your soul into the book and successfully in that respect um so i'm sorry to be abrupt but i want to ask you i want to move on to a couple of these discourse questions and then wrap it up and so how do you when you say that you sense from that Aspen thing that things may be changing. Why do you think they are changing? If they, I, I agree with you. I think they're changing. Now I watch the drip coming out of the faucet every five seconds, and I say, oh, it's changing. The water's coming. You know, I'm. This is my job, and I have no perspective, no perspective whatsoever. But I'm curious if it's changing. Why do you think it's changing? Um. I think for, for several reasons, um, there's, there's a greater public awareness now, but in the literary world, because of the struggles of other people, in particular, black America, um, within, you know, it's always, it's always black America sort of leading the way and opening the doors for all of us. There are more people of color in positions to judge things, to make decisions. Um, so I think that's one thing. That's one reason that there is. Um, so, for example, prizes are, are are not as dominated by a single perspective, a, you know, this kind of worldview that um, where it's not OK to to express the fullness of Palestinian humanity. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is. Um, there, there, there are more Palestinian institutions now in the United States, or at least you know, Palis um, institutions that are that are speaking um, for you know, speaking in the language of Palestinians, I guess, or or, or speaking our narrative, or um, criticizing Israel more. Um, Mondo Weiss being one of them, you know, the Electronic Intifada. Um, so there's this whole sort of community of of independent journalism that has arisen that I I feel has has made a big difference in in public discourse in this country on Palestine. So that's another reason, um, which you know which sort of raises um, or, or spurs curiosity by readers who. Um, who sort of, and this is, this comes from actually a lot of letters that I've received from readers who just say, you know, I always kind of felt like something just was incomplete about this narrative that we hear from the public, but I never, I, I never knew. Um, in reading your books, I see how in the dark I've been, how brainwashed we've been, how much the media conceals um, about, you know, what Israel, what what it meant for Israel to be established and what it still means for them, for their expansionist um, enterprise. So I think it's just, you know, I think it's a combination of those things. Um, I don't know if you, if you have, you know, if you, if you have a, another perspective on that, I would actually love to hear it because I've been thinking about that a lot as well. Like, you know, I'm a little bit, 
dumbfounded that this book is kind of getting the kinds of um, of praise from you know mainstream literary circles. Um, and I'm very happy about it, but you know. Yeah. I, well, uh, I'm going to answer in the form of a move on to another question, which uh, and. I, I first I want to say I agree with you about the two factors you raised, and the one other that I would this isn't about my thoughts, but I am very parochial and Jewish in my outlook. Uh, I come from a very successful Jewish generation that sort of conquered the establishment, you know, from my perspective in the '70s and '80s as I got out of college, and I was lifted with that generation, and I think that to some degree some of these cultural discursive questions involve a uh, sort of Jewish permission on this subject. And I think that Jewish permission wasn't really granted to this narrative at all, um, uh, at all. Uh, it was banned, absolutely banned for 50 years. And I'm not saying that's the, why your book is getting more attention, but I, this, the question I want to segue to is what we've seen in, in, in my parochial perspective inside the Jewish community is that for many years, there's always been a synagogue book. Uh, even reform synagogues have said, oh, you want to understand what's happening in Israel? You got to read this book. And the rabbi will give a sermon about it and they'll be part of the book club. And traditionally, this has been a book like uh, an Amos Oz novel um, from uh, certainly the book of laughter and forgetting or darkness or whatever laughter whatever that one about his mother's suicide that was one of those books Ari Shavit's My Promised Land was one of those books some of Benny Morris's work was part part of that you know what here's the book that you need to understand this conflict mm -hmm. and my job actually uh, my job will be done and which I hope will be done in a couple of years <laughs> will be when your book is the synagogue book you know, okay. And this raises, I, 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 this is not a subject I, I think you really want to get into, but, you know, Colin McCann's book is now, I think, a little bit of a synagogue book um, that came out this summer, and you reviewed it in Al Jazeera. Do you want to talk about that at all? Okay, I mean, you don't want, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I reviewed it, and it's in, you know, it's in Al Jazeera. People can, people can read okay. it. Okay. Um, you know, I think. Look, it's uh, it, it has it has a function, um, and uh, but I, you know, and you've heard me um, talk about this and and write about this before. But I, um, I had some real criticisms of the book and and the idea that, um, you know, a, a privileged white male can who doesn't speak Arabic, who doesn't speak Hebrew, um, is really the person who who gets to tell uh, who. Who gets to tell this this sort of who gets to be the face of the the new narrative because that's kind of how this book was propelled right it wasn't just another novel about Palestine it was it was the novel you know and it was the one submitted for the Booker it was the one that you know um, what's his name Spielberg decides you know to to option. yes yes very uh, important so yeah. yeah so that matters it matters mm -hmm. that of course you know again. I mean, we have no shortage of talented um, writers in among Palestinians. Um, I am one of hundreds of Palestinian writers who who write beautifully and eloquently about our lives and about our realities. Um, and to to sort of single out the one book that is written by um, a, Euro a European white man is, um, you know. Fill in, fill in the word. Okay, Susie, do you do you sense any? I, you know, I want to add another factor in this discursive change, and that might be embarrassment. I think that um, some of what happened post George Floyd, uh, when there has we've seen a great shifting in this country. I think part of it is embarrassment on the part of that. Uh, you know, a, a, a class that I am certainly a member of, the white male you know, privileged uh, class, especially guys like me in their 50s and 60s, I think there's some embarrassment. And that's part of the like- Embarrassment in what way? 
you know, <laughs> what are we responsible for? Mm -hmm. You know, what? Well, Jesus, you know, okay, take it away. You know, <laughs> the world's heard enough. The world's heard enough from us. You know, that's kind of, I think that's that I, I'm, I'm projecting my own feelings here, but I, those, those are often an, my, my best guide to how the world works. So, but, you know, you're, you're kind of, um, you're not the majority. I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're more in the exception category because most people of your demographic still feel entitled to, to speak for other people and to explain the lives of people who, you know, that, that they don't know. Um, and that's still, you know, we still see that. We still see it in publishing. We see it in film. We see it in, in all kinds of media. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah. So, Susie, I see. I mean, I don't mean to in cut off your answer. I, I accept your point. I take your point. Uh, fair enough. I, I, I can't quarrel with that. I, I see that it's 57 minutes, and I want to wrap up soon. And so the last little bit, I was hoping just to ask you about Joseph Robinette Biden. Do you have any thoughts about um, – Biden and his uh, and what that means for Palestine. Do you have any? If if you don't want to talk about politics, I understand it, but I don't know if you. I, I mean, curious I'm curious how you're feeling about the Biden moment. I'm not a supporter of Biden. Okay. <laughs> no. That doesn't mean I'm a um, that doesn't mean I'm a Trump supporter either. Okay. Uh, I did write a. I wrote an essay actually in, a, in Al Jazeera um, a week ago about about the about the election. Um, look. You know, I, I, uh, I'm with everybody else that you know Trump is 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 horrendous, um, but the idea that Biden is is the savior or that he's really truly so much better than than Trump is is a very um, internal kind of it's a very privileged perspective, honestly, because my feeling is that you know. The, the big difference between Trump and his predecessors is not just that he is he's this, he's so overtly racist and 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 more explicit in his misogyny and his ableism and racism. All of those things are true. But I think the biggest difference is that Donald Trump has turned um, the ethos of empire inward, right? And 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 he has his 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 outlook has been crushing uh the people within this country in many ways whereas his predecessors um perhaps with you know better temperaments with greater eloquence better looking and and better um uh, and more even tempered have not, have still been just as racist just as misogynistic just as awful, but they turned the, those ethos outward against the defenseless world in in a multitude of imperial wars that have um, that have crushed other nations thousandfold more than what Donald Trump has done in this country. And the fact that Americans honestly um, see Donald Trump as somehow so much worse really says to me that they never really saw us you know they never saw what this country did to other part they, they never saw what this country did to iraq for example what this country did to libya nothing donald trump has done in this country or or beyond can ever match what his predecessors did to iraq and what they did to libya and i and that needs to be said um, this is not a defense of Donald Trump. I abhor him, um, but I also abhor Biden and I abhor everything he stands for and all of his predecessors, all of Trump's predecessors as well, because they have destroyed so many parts of the world and they have left so many people in, 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 in a kind of misery you cannot even fathom in this country. So no, I'm not a Biden fan. And, and, Biden is is certainly most likely to perpetuate that and probably escalate it. Where do you see him potentially escalating that? I mean, that's, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's he's talked some shit about Iran already. Um, you know, Donald Trump may do that as well. 
Like, it's just, you know, I, I don't see the huge difference that everybody else sees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I see, I see, I see the difference in, in, um, and how explicit they are about things. I see the stupidity of Donald Trump, his complete lack of empathy, um, which is, you know, I haven't really seen empathy from any other presidents either. Uh, the difference too is is on environmental issues. I care I care deeply about non-human life um, and about our planet. You know, I think for me that that's, you know, that's the only area where there, you know, where I see political difference. Um, but otherwise, in terms of brutality, lack of empathy, misogyny, racism, um, and a track a track record of those things. I mean, Biden really is um, is is Trump's equal in those things. So, do you, when it comes to Palestine, the politics of Palestine, or for that matter, you know, Syria? Um, or Yemen, do you see any possible hope in a Biden administration? No. I mean, I don't know why why anyone would. I mean, he's been he's already been very explicit about um, you know, what he's gonna do for Israel and and mm -hmm. so has, you know, Kamala Harris. I mean they're they they have both are ardent Zionists, um mm -hmm. have made mm -hmm. statements to to that effect. They have both said um, that, you know, the, the embassy will remain in Jerusalem, uh, mm -hmm. that they're going to, you know, that they support, you know, they're supporting the settlements, that they're mm -hmm. supporting, you know, this, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Israeli, well, you know, basically genocide in the name of Israeli security. Mm -hmm. supported but, by this administration. Certainly those policies, the White House policies are not going to really affect, or maybe there are two games here. I mean, there's the mainstream political game, and then there's the BDS campaign, grassroots campaign and struggle, global struggle for Palestinian freedom. And that seems to me to be continuing apace, and maybe even in, with greater strength than ever right now. Uh, do you agree with that? Um. I do. I think uh, I think BDS has had a, a tremendous um, impact uh -huh. on on discourse for sure. Um, so again, like you know, I don't I don't really look to administrations for. Uh -huh. change. I don't look to. I mean, I don't think politicians really are. Um, they're not. They're not the, the you know the, the the spring the wellspring of revolution or change. Mm -hmm. I mean, politicians ultimately are followers. They they mm -hmm. have they're going to follow the people mm -hmm. and it's up to people to lead. Um, to, I want to say regarding your comment earlier about you know Jewish permission for this narrative. Um, you know, like if you if you think during the uh, during the civil rights movement. Um, it's 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 a bit like saying you know what what sort of what propelled that movement was that you know was white permission that that allowed this sort of the the narrative of black humanity to to uh, to come to the fore. Um, it sort of it it negates the years and decades of sacrifice of the people who have been fighting for that, um, and you know, you have to ask, what is it about, you know, what made, um, what, what changed in the Jewish community? What made that change possible? What made, you know, what changed your, your outlook? You know, you were, you come from a, a, a an Orthodox Jewish Zionist background, you know, what was it that infiltrated that consciousness? Um, and to me, you know, none of that would have changed had it not been for the sustained um, sacrifices that have never let up by Palestinians. Um, if we had just sort of disappeared into the night, we, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. It has been, you know, the, the death um, and struggle of millions of Palestinians over uh, 70 or over a hundred years now almost. Um, for for liberation and and that is really I mean I think I think you have to recognize that everything that that flows from that whether it's it, whether it's you know um, the evolution of 
of, of Jewish morality when it comes to this question. That's not propelled by something internal. It's propelled by, by a Palestinian struggle and a fight that, that maybe awakens something in, in people who don't know mm -hmm. um, and who are then forced to confront their roles and forced mm -hmm. to confront their realities and their contribution to this oppression. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't want to take away, um, you know, people, everybody has, we all have a role in each other's liberations, um, you know, and, um, and, and we, you know, I'm, I'm of the mind that, you know, all boats rise <laughs> together. Um, and I think, I think our liberation, um, is connected with each other. And like I was saying earlier, you know, black people sort of struggling to open these doors for people of color. I mean, that's, you know, that's, we're connected in that way. You know, we, all boats rise. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I think ultimately it is, you know, Jewish people um, opposing Zionism is just as much for Jewish people, for, for, uh -huh for you for your for for the humanity of Jewish people as much as it is, as it is for Palestinians uh -huh. you know I think that um, uh, in the same way that you know white people sort of becoming you know a little bit less mean um, is it, it was for their own you know the civil rights movement was for <laughs> was for the salvation of white people as well uh -huh. not just uh -huh just mm -hmm. black people i mean i you know i think black people were fine right mm -hmm. it was just white people it was really white people that had to be less oppressive and, mm -hmm. and kinder and better humans um and i think that i think that's true for for israel this mm -hmm. is for their salvation as well they t t so they can evolve to be better people and not so oppressive and not so horrible towards the indigenous population so i don't yeah it, I, I i i'm kind of i i want to just push back on that you know okay. Jewish people kind of being saviors uh, in the okay. moment. <laughs> well, Susie, um, that's great. I, I, I take your point. Um, and we're at 108, and I think that's a great place to to end our discussion. I wanted to thank you very much and uh, for your patience and you. uh, forthcomingness and uh, eloquence. And people should read your book, Against the Loveless World. It's always a pleasure, Phil. I really okay. appreciate it. I know. Well, well I, 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 yeah, I, I share that feeling. So um, I hope to see you in the flesh one of these days after COVID.